church. Gotcha. We good? We good. Sorry about that. I'm kind of uh, talking, but y'all couldn't hear me. It's good to be together with everybody this morning. It's not quite the same, but it's better than it's been. So I say. It's good to see people's faces, and it's good to still be with you guys here on Zoom. You know, as usual, if you're on Zoom, please turn your cameras on. We want to see you. You know, we want to see you. We want to have 
that feeling the fellowship. We want to be able to see everybody kind of mouthing the words for worship. We want to see everybody kind of, you know, like really getting into the sermon. Or if you kind of like falling asleep, we want to see that too, because it's, it's family and we want to be able to make fun of you. Uh, but please, please, if you are doing something that you don't want people to see on Zoom, like you need to go to the restroom or you got to do something else, some, please turn your camera off. Man. Otherwise, keep it on. For everybody here, thanks for coming. And please, everybody online, give us a little grace. If anything goes wrong, preferably nothing goes wrong. But, you know, we're doing something new. So technical difficulties or I don't want to say inevitable, but likely. So without further ado, I'll pray for service and we'll get started. Father in heaven, it's good to be with you this morning, and I'm excited to worship with everyone today. I pray that the, the service is encouraging, that the uh, that the contribution, the communion, that the sermon, that the, the worship songs, that everything, the whole experience can be great, family building, and encouraging. I pray that it can draw us closer to you and to one another. It's in Christ, amen. Thank you. 
You gotta make sure you're right, you know what I'm saying? What's up, y'all? Hello, you guys be seated, sit down. Y'all already sit, sit down on Zoom, that's already a thing, that, that's already happening right now. If you're standing though, you can sit down, it's cool. But what's up, y'all? My name is Manny, uh, Manny Joshua. I am, we're, what's, what's something you need to know about me? I'm Canadian, that's a thing, I'm from Canada. Um, and I am um, joyfully engaged to Molly Lishney. I, I got this ring yesterday. I haven't been able to take it off. So I, I, don't know, I don't know if that's normal. That's the thing. But it's happening. And it's right now. But we're not married yet. Uh, but real quick shout out to all the people that have been helping us. Okay? Vince and Robin for doing our premarital counseling. Bill and Molden for not smacking me upside the head. Bill and Kristen, sorry I should say. And then uh, Edwin and Rachel. Y'all have helped us out in a lot of ways too. So thank you. So if you can get some turn to Mark 12. We're going to be in there. In a second, but I'm going to start with a number, a little illustration to, to engage everyone. Okay, so it's just a number. Okay, so 80%. Oh, come on now. We all wonder what this is about. Uh, huh? All right, so 80%. So this is, they did a study. I'm going to let you guys know they did a study, and 80% of American citizens are in debt. This is a financial conversation, but that's kind of scary. <laughs> but 80%, okay? And so what that means is that if you look at the, the amount of money that people have versus the amount of money that people owe, 
most people ain't got no money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if you did, if you did the math, like it's plus minus. At some point, it's plus minus. You can do the formulas and stuff, but sometimes it's just plus minus. Um, and so what that means is that it doesn't mean that you don't have money to use. It just means that obviously most Americans don't have the ultimate authority over their resources. And so this isn't a financial conversation, um, but I think that this is kind of a relevant thing when it comes to when it comes to our resources and how we use them, right? Um, I think authority and ultimate authority um, is important because like you can have something but not own something. Does that make sense? And, and you can have something that that's 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 more of a loan. So for example, your car, right? If you're paying a car note, you have the car, but if the bank for some reason wants the car back, yeah. well, right, you, 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 you got to give it back. And so, and so you can use it, but you don't have it. And so, so obviously this is a broken example because we can pay off our cars. Amen. Come on now. We can pay, we can pay off our homes. Amen. And we can, we can get out of debt. We can finally own our pieces of paper. Amen. All right. So that's good. But the idea of having things that are on loan um, is very relevant. Now, obviously, when it comes to, to God and when it comes to giving, 2 Corinthians 9 tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, right? So God's not going to use authority to coerce income from you or to coerce your time or to say, give me that, like, you know, give me that, whatever. That's not how God operates, right? Because like Vince says all the time, God has a lot of money, right? God doesn't necessarily need that. God is time. God doesn't necessarily need your time, right? Um, but there's something to be said about that cheerful giver part. Um, and so in America, just having this conversation around authority is important. So, so Mark 12, 13, 17, Jesus kind of addresses this issue. So it reads this. There's a lot of context. So I'm just going to read 13, 17. So later, the leaders sent Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said. We know how honest you are. You're impartial. You don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Jesus saw through the hypocrisy and said, in Jesus' fashion, why are you trying to trap me? Right? <laughs> he was like, come on now. <laughs> right? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. When they handed it to him, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's. Like, duh, like it's right there. They replied. They didn't say the duh part, but. <laughs> well, then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So Jesus pretty quickly, he attacks the issue of authority here. And they're obviously trying to trap them, you know, by what they're asking. Um, but really, the question they're asking is, who has ultimate authority over, over this? Like, like, does Caesar have the right here? Right? Like, does this belong to him? And, and if so, does he have the right to actually ask for this? Because if he did, then he would. Right? So it's a question of authority. And obviously, if, if, they, if he says no, because God's the ultimate authority, then like, oh, you're, you're, you're um, a heretic or all that kind of stuff. So be, that's what they're trying to do. But, um, but Jesus says he addresses authority in, in one simple line. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And give unto God what is God's. As in there are things that belong to Caesar, but there are things that belong to God. And if you think about our body, right? We're made in the image of God. So our bodies belong to God. If you think about time, God is time. He's beginning and the end. God is time. Our time really belongs to God. If you think about, you know, our money and our finances, I know in America, this is an interesting subject. But if you think about our finances, like it's God, like we have the money, but, but Deuteronomy tells us it's God who gives us the power to create wealth. So God has enabled us to have the money, right? And I think a lot of people struggle financially in America because we don't operate by the principles that God has given us that govern the way these things work. And so what if we live like our life was on loan? What if we live like our life was on loan? How would we steward our lives? How would we steward our time? I'm not saying Netflix is bad, but would we watch the entire Stranger Things in one day, you know? <laughs> would we do that? Or would we take our time to, to cultivate the talents, the gifts, the abilities to, to make something of what God has given us, right? How would we steward our body, right? Would we use our body to indulge in things like pornography? Would we use our bodies to indulge in things like over, over drinking or all these, or overeating or all these things? Or would we use our bodies as a temple, right? We use our bodies as a temple 
um, our talent, I already mentioned that, but hey, what about that writing ability that you have? Would you use your talent to maybe write that book that you know you should be writing, right? To build that business that you know you should have been building. To work on that guitar skill, you know you should have been doing that, but I like Stranger Things, back to Stranger Things again, right? <laughs> right? And then what about our money? Will we be grateful that God has enabled us to have the specific amount of money that we can live on, and then we can use the rest of the money to our local church so that they can do things in the community for people who don't have that same opportunities that we have? Right? How would we do that? So the best part is that on the back end of all this, as we live and operate under the principles of God, the best part is that God is, is on the back end, ready to bless people's obedience, ready to bless people's obedience with their time, with their, with their money, with their resources, and all those things to, to, to you know, give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together, run over. Now, that was used for judgment, for sure, but that's a, not the contextual thing. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Bill, leave me alone on that, okay? Um, but... But the, the, the principle holds true that, that God does want us to be faithful with our resources. And this is an opportunity where in one fashion, just financially, it's just one, that God, um, that we have the opportunity to be faithful with what God has given to us in our finances, right? So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to, to participate in what you're doing. And thank you so much that we have the opportunity to participate um, in the work that you're doing. You don't, you don't need us, but as a good father, you want us to be able to participate. As a good father, you want us to be able to, to take part and to, and to see what it's like to live a life of radical obedience, to see what it's like to live a life in obedience to you, um, as opposed to just hoarding everything for, for ourselves, because uh, we know what that feels like, and, and it hasn't worked yet. So I pray that, that, we'll, that we'll have the heart to participate in, what, in, in the way that you want us to, so that we can experience what you have for us, Father. I pray that in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I have just a couple of announcements to read to you guys. Um, first of all, ladies, if you haven't already signed up for your women's service projects for this month, uh, please do so. Go out to hope.ww.gatewaycitychurch.info. If you're not sure which project you should be doing, talk to your house church leader and they can uh, steer you in the right direction. On this Friday, we have our singles devotional online. <laughs> I was talking to Felicia Rogers just before I got up here, and she said it's going to be a continuation of what uh, what was discussed at the women's event, so it should be pretty good. Um, men are invited too. This is men, men and women, men and women. So, yes, <laughs> the Zoom link will be sent out on the singles group me. Um, if you don't, if you aren't part of the singles group me, talk to Felicia. Send her, send her a text, an email, something, and she'll steer you in the right direction. And. Uh, we have our Women's Midweek coming up on Wednesday, March 24th at 7 p.m. The link for that will be sent out soon. Uh, on April 24th and 25th, teens, we have our Heartland Prom. Cost is $64 per person, includes both prom and the after prom event. Those unable to attend prom can choose to attend just the after prom for only $35. Contact Jeanette Mix if you have questions. And uh, save the date. Um, we're still deciding on camp. I know a few of you have contacted me. Are we having camp? Are we not having camp? Um, no decision has been made yet. But save the dates, June 13th through 19th, June 22nd through 26th for HYC and HKK, respectively. More information about those will be communicated soon. Uh, that's going to do it for our announcements today. Thanks, everyone. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be together. For those that are joining us for Zoom, you might notice that some of the speakers are coming up and we're speckled. We have uh, these little dots. What we're doing, uh, if you do choose to come in, uh, you're given a choice between a green dot, which means hug away, uh, or a red dot, which means fist bump or wave. Uh, which is awesome because that way anyone that has one feeling or another uh, has the opportunity to kind of gauge how much the fellowship engages. So there will be no free radical huggers just running around doing it just, you know, just, I've been cooped up for so long. You know, there's, there's not going to be any of that. We want, if you, if you feel up to it, we want people to feel free to come in. And uh, this is not a mark. We don't want to separate anyone. We want you here so much that we want to do whatever it takes in the fellowship to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel safe. And uh, man, we're just excited to have anyone together. Uh, and we're excited to, uh, to be able to share this kind of in tandem uh, as we go virtually as well. You know, we, uh, we're in the book of Acts. Uh, we're doing this all year. 
Uh, and we're, uh, we're in the theme of reading the book of Acts as though it's happening in real time. Uh, because for us on this side of the crucifixion, you know, now that we're 2,000 years uh, into it, we tend to read the Bible like something that happened long ago. And it did happen long ago, but the idea is that the whole thing gets started with the gospel, good news, which is, which is emphasized news. It's news. It's not meant to be a philosophic discussion of your theological stance. It's meant to be a statement of certain facts that, if they're true, force you to ask the question, well, what does that mean? And when you ask that question, what does that mean? It leads you to the obvious decision, what am I supposed to do about it? Because that's how we always receive news. That's why we watch news programs. They come up and tell us what happened. Then they bring in an expert to tell us what it means or what it could possibly mean. Usually they split the screen and someone tells you what it means from this point of view and someone tells you what it means on that point of view. Then they argue and we just get fired up about the argument. And most of the time, I don't know about you, I'm totally lost. Like, what was happening again? But, but that's, what, that's what's going on because when we hear certain facts that are challenging, we have to ask the question, what does it mean? And once we find out what it, what it means, we have to go, okay, if that's true, then what am I supposed to do? And I think we as a church are going to be so much more effective at ministering to not only others' needs that need to hear the gospel, but even to our own needs. If we start to realize there are certain things true about us that are revolutionary. And because we're sort of familiar with one another, we don't really treat this assembly, this assembly online. We don't really treat the fact that we're all together, maybe with the sacredness it deserves. Because it started becoming a philosophical discussion about church. Church has become kind of this thing of, well, it's kind of a this to that. And we need to read the book of Acts as though it is news because church is a brand new concept. Church as, as the word, as, the, as an assembly of people under the name of Jesus. That had never been done before until the book of Acts. And we get a chance to kind of study what does that mean? mean and of course anytime we study this it should trouble us because it's not a comfortable answer to the question what does it mean and that's my assignment this morning <laughs> very excited about the tantalizing opening there bill okay let's go to acts chapter four and uh, this is going to be one of those studies where we're not doing the work for you. We're not putting the words on the screen. Uh, is that right, uh, Hadrian? We're not putting scripture on the screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this one is going to be one you actually have to get out that thing that's on your, on your phone, or maybe you even have one of these analog things called a Bible. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, it's this message is going to mean more to you if you can actually look at the scripture and wrestle with it with with the sermon because this deserves some wrestling it deserves some pause it deserves a little bit of reverency as we start to go god is revealing some stuff and i want to know what it means so let's let's read here in acts chapter 4 verse 32 all the believers were one in heart and mind no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. Brought, them to, brought the money from the cells and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he, uh, he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, there was a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. 
With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled so filled your heart that you would have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept some of the money for your, uh, you have received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it, uh, after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Yeah, right? I don't care who you are, if you're a seasoned Bible pro, or you're reading this for the first time, this is troubling. This doesn't make any good sense. We know good and well there are people who sin in worse ways, both in the Old Testament and in the New, who got busted, cold busted, and did not get struck down dead. We know this is, I mean, we know how the story was supposed to go. Ananias, you lying, dirty crook. Didn't you know you can't lie to God? Now tell the truth. Ah, oh, you right. You got me. My bad. Don't you ever do that again. And then Ananias repented and all was well. And no one told any more lies. Contribution was amazing. I don't want you to make a mistake. This has nothing to do with your contribution. This has everything to do with the new thing God is doing. Remember, the good news isn't that a new and improved system has come into play. The good news is that God is now doing a brand new thing which is the fulfillment of all things. And what you have in Luke, you have this pattern of storytelling, which he's going to do time and time again. This is one of the seven summary statements. Uh, the end of Acts, Acts 4 is one of the seven summary statements where, where Luke wants us to pause and kind of recap what was going on during the church at that time. He, he forces us to pause and he starts going, okay, watch this. We have external growth and internal peace. That's the summary. That's, that's the fruit of the good news. But watch what happens when you bring good news into the world. You have external opposition and you have internal conflict. Because God is doing some things which are incredibly important with this new group of unqualified men and women. You know, Acts 42, or I'm not, Acts 4, verse 32, introduces this uh, uh, to us this summary statement, which kind of shows this is what the fulfillment of the temple was meant to look like. You know, for generations, people had been going to the temple of God to bring offering, to find atonement, to, to be brought together, but also as a way of celebrating God's bounty and meeting needs for others. This had always been the case. 
The temple was not just a time where you made yourself clean, went into a place in pristine condition, newly washed, fresh and clean. You know, you're able to be before God because you are unclean. And now because you're an unclean, you can now stand before God and worship. The whole point of the temple was for you to bring your best and you bring it in and you put it at the feet of the priest. And the priest takes this offering, knowing that you're full of sin. He takes this offering and then repurposes it. Takes the, the meat of the sacrifice and starts to distribute it. To those that were by lot, who were told you were not to have any property, God's going to feed them. They were called the priests. But also to those who had need, God's going to take these sacrifices and then distribute it to those who had needs, real needs. The temple was a place of a house of prayer. All could come in. All are invited. But by this time, the temple had kind of lost its veneer. You know what I'm saying? It kind of lost its way. It was all about cleanliness, not about invitation. It was all about looking right and dressing right, not about doing right. Which is why Jesus always got into trouble with the temple. You know, my favorite story of this is John chapter 5, which is not normally a story you go to when you're reading Acts 4, but I want us to just think about it. You remember that story when Jesus went to the pool near the sheep gate? You remember who was there? There was an invalid who had been there for 38 years. And the reason why the invalid was there was because every once in a while, God would send an angel. The angel would touch the water. The water would be stirred. And whoever got into the water would get healed. And the story you think is about this one individual who had been kind of in a stuck place and Jesus shows up and heals him. But really what the story shows is that this is a complete indictment of the people of the temple. It was an indictment because the story exists because instead of helping people, instead of distributing to the needs, people who were like this invalid felt like I have nowhere else to go. In fact, it was the pool near the sheep gate. You know what they do at the pool near the sheep gate? Guess who gets washed there? The sheep. Because you're not the only thing that needs to be clean before you go into the temple. So in this nasty water of sheep, whatever, God would send an angel to kind of go, I've got to get those who have no hope, some hope. That at the temple, something good is going to happen. And so there they were, the crippled, the lame, the blind, all waiting for that miraculous moment where the, where the water would be stirred. Now, the, the religious elite never were at the pool, but Jesus was. There's Jesus in John chapter 5, very early on. He's at the pool. And it's, it's an incredible indictment because the needs that the temple were supposed to meet aren't getting met. And so people will turn to anything that they think might meet their needs. And we've experienced that, right? You know, we all, there's always going to be some sort of pool. Like, hey, man, hadn't seen you at Bible talk. Oh, I go to the pool now. <laughs> yeah, the pool's where it's at. The pool is where all the healing really begins. In fact, I've had a, had a cousin who had a friend whose mom had a hangnail. Got into that water, hangnail was gone. Praise be to Jesus, or praise be to God. Yeah, the pool exists because real needs aren't being met. But the pool is also an indictment about this story. is also an indictment about the people of the pool. Because there's a guy who had been laid there for 38 years, and no one helped him into the water. 38 years, he has no ability. He can't even roll. He has no ability. No one's there helping him. No one's bringing him in. They're all like, oh, it's all about the pool. Yeah, the pool's where it's at. No, I don't go to the establishment anymore. The institution is dead to me because the pool's where it's at. But the pool has someone there. 
who's been there for 38 years and no one's helped him in. The story is an indictment of the people of the temple, but boy, is it indictment of the people of the pool. Which is crazy important. Because Luke's about to transition us from a brick and mortar temple into a temple built of flesh and blood. These stories told to us by the preachers of the gospel in the first century are important because they're informing us that there are certain patterns that are going to be true if you make this all about you. People will divide when it's all about you. When you when you make the, 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 the temple about looking right and being right, but not necessarily doing right. But it's just as condemning for those that kind of go, well, because they're not meeting my needs, and that might be legitimate. They might not, but you go to a pool, and it's still all about you. It's the same sin. It's the same spirit. It's the same problem. And there Jesus is balancing both. He's at the pool. He finds the guy. This guy doesn't have any faith. This guy doesn't make one confession of faith about Jesus. He is, in fact, it's hard to like this guy. He whines. Jesus overlooks it, heals him. He gets busted because he was healed on the Sabbath. He's carrying his mat. And then someone stops him. Hey, who he? How are you carrying back? Well, the guy who healed me uh, told me to carry my back. What's his name? Oh, I don't know. You don't know? And then get this. Then he finds out who heals him later because Jesus walks up, and says, "Well, you're better now. Now stop sinning, or something worse will happen to you." You know what the guy does? He doesn't follow Jesus. He doesn't become his disciple. He doesn't. He goes and snitches on Jesus to the temple. And we all know snitches. Not if you follow Jesus. Come on now. <laughs> Set you up. You took the bait. That was easy. That was too easy. Too easy. But let's get back to our story. Luke is presenting what the temple looks like in real time. There are no needy persons among them. People so moved by this new life. People so moved by this new news. So moved by the reality that God was no longer tucked away in the Holy of Holies. He was living in something so unholy, the likes of you and me. And here we are, and we get to live this new life where the rules of heaven and the rules of earth are going to collide, and they're going to become one. They called that kingdom. They called that temple. This is what it's supposed to look like. No needy persons among them, and you even have a Levite leading the way. Funny, Levites were the ones who worked the temple. So do you think Luke is doing this by accident? Absolutely not. He goes, there was one guy who everyone nicknamed son of encouragement. This guy is a baller. He is awesome. But he's also a Levite, which means he knows temple when he sees one. And when he saw this new temple, he goes, what? There's a need. I got some land. Levites weren't supposed to own land anyway, but I got some. I'm going to go sell that. I'm going to go give that. And they put it at the apostles' feet, and they didn't even have a board of directors. What? They didn't have a board of directors. There was no financial meeting. They just said, meet some needs. Now, I believe in the board of directors. We need to have one because we give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But that's all we've given them. Come down. Come down. Come down. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Now let's get to the dirt. <laughs> yeah, this is dirty. And you know Luke's being dirty because he starts the sentence with now. Actually, in the Greek, it's but. The NIV changes it because everyone knows you don't start a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> but in the Greek, it's there because Luke is making a direct. He goes, you only put a but at the beginning of a sentence if it's directly correlated with the sentence prior. This was, you know, this text originally had no chapters and verses. 
You are supposed to read this as a unit. It's a comparison. But there was a man named Ananias. As the temple is being formed, misunderstood the story completely. And this is where we don't really like the story very much. But it's it's not a new story. You know, Joshua led God's people into the land. And they came up to Jericho, which was the main fortress protecting all of the land that was telling the people of God, this land does not belong to you. And God's going, no, it's yours. This is where I designed you to be. This is what I promised Abraham. I need you to go take the land. Jericho stood defiant. But God wanting to make a point says, we're going to take down Jericho, but you are not to take advantage of Jericho. Everything in that city is devoted to me. It is not yours. And they go in, and they they have this great victory, miraculous victory uh, of Jericho. They take over, and then one guy, one guy saw a shiny cloak saw some silver, saw a bar of gold, and says, it would be such a shame to waste this. And he took it for himself and hid it in his tent. God's retribution came on the entire country as they, or the entire army, as they went to go take a much smaller, less fortified, shouldn't even have, should should have just said, hey, you guys want to give up? Sure, yeah. But they fought back and they whooped the Israelites that day. The Israelites panic, why have you left us, God? And he goes, because someone's already missed the story. This is mine, not yours. And one of you took what belongs to me and claimed it as his own. Achan was found out. He was disciplined divinely. And God did it once. There was a time when the tabernacle, as they start to become more established, the tabernacle was was in a stage of becoming the main centerpiece of every Jewish encampment. And and one of these times in Leviticus 10, you know, uh, 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 Aaron's boys kind of were there and they're carrying the ark and they just kind of get careless. I mean, they just got, well, God's living in this thing, sure. And they handled the ark as though it was just another box. And they were struck down. God was doing something once. There was another time when, when it was time for the, for the presence of God to go from a tent to a temple. David's men went and grabbed it. They, were, they put it on an ox cart, and the ox stumbled, and the, it looked like the ark was going to wobble. And one of the guys helped put out his hand to stop it. Again, treating it like it was just another box. And God struck him down, and David threw a fit because no one likes this story. But God's going, you don't understand. I've got to do something once so all of you might know what you're dealing with. I am a God who chooses to be among you. I am a God who chooses to be in you. I love you. I adore you. You are mine. Of all the people of the world, I choose you. Of course, I choose every person, but I choose you. You have listened. You have held to me, but you have to understand who you're dealing with. I am holy. I am different. I am separate. And when you treat what is holy as profane, God does something once so that everyone will understand. This is who I am, even though I am showing you great grace. Ananias comes into the New Testament story. Because once again, we have a people coming into the land with the presence of God. We have have the presence of God going into a tabernacle, which is a tent. Uh, And then we have the tent, the presence of God going from a tent into a temple. And now we have God going from a temple into a people. The story is the same. When you treat what is holy as profane, 
God goes, I just, I, I want to only have to do this once. But I'm doing it once and for all. You must understand what I am about. But you also need to understand who you are. This is why Peter, in all of his letters, the first and second letter of Peter, towards the end of your Bible, notice how much temple reference he makes. You are like living stones. You are like a spiritual house. You are a holy people, a, a royal priesthood, a, a, a people belonging to God. It's temple image, temple image, temple image. You want to know why? Because Peter interpreted this news. What does this mean? We are the temple. And what Ananias did, he shows, he, he really reveals his hand. He shows that even amongst God's people, Satan has a place. Because here we are in Acts 5, and we have the first appearance of Satan in our story. How has Satan so filled your heart? Boy, he is always about that, isn't he? Trying to divide Ananias. I, I know it doesn't matter how much you give, but just, just say that you gave the whole thing so you can look as awesome as Barnabas. Yeah, that's a good plan. Honey, you down? I'm down. Oh, Sapphira girl, come on now. You know, and God does something that's way uncomfortable. But he does it once so that we can all see it. It's important. And Luke puts this story, and it's just probably how it happened. He puts this story right next to the image of what the temple is supposed to look like. People sacrificing, people giving, people making sure needs are met, people, people striving with all their hearts to, to, to be there. And this is hard when we stop seeing the church as God's dwelling place. I remember there was a time, not here, because lo, lo and behold, this would never happen at the Gateway City Church. But there was a time... When an older sister, who, you know, she had been working children's ministry since she, you know, for the last 103 years. <laughs> she was part of the worship team, even though her voice was breaking a little bit. There was a time when I ran into a sister and she said, and I said to her, hey, great song service today. Thank you for leading us. And she goes, well, good, because that's it. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, that's it. Like, we're not singing those songs anymore. I love those songs. She goes, no, you guys will be singing it, but I'm done. That's it. And even though I had appointments, I kind of went, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean that's it? Like, I'm done. I quit. Why? No one here takes me seriously. No one takes you seriously? Yeah, no one takes me seriously. What do you mean no one takes you seriously? I mean, and, and you, know, the, as, you know, as an older person that's been around since Moses brought the tablets down, you know, from Sinai, you know, you know how you get when you're a little bit older. You always got something snarky to say about all the young people. You always got some sort of joke. You always got something like that. This was one of those sisters, too. She always had something, you know, kind of sarcastic. It was biting, but in a cute way. And I was like, what do you mean no one takes you seriously? No one takes me seriously. I've had, I have feelings and no one cares. No one cares. Sister, you're wrong. She goes, no, I'm not. I think, yes, you are. The conversation had to end there because after all, I had appointments. But you know, it, that conversation stole the joy. And so I was like, that's one of those conversations you have to have a follow-up conversation to. So I said, hey, I need to talk to you. She goes, can if you want to. I'm like, do you realize what you're accusing us of? You're, you're accusing us of not being a church. You're accusing us of committing one of the deadly sins of not caring. And you're wrong. She goes, no, I'm not. 
I'm like, yes, you are. She said, prove it. And I said, girl, let me, let me introduce you to all these things the movement is doing around the world. I mean, if she was here, I would say, listen, you know what happens when someone moves into this congregation and they have no place to live? Patrick can talk about this. I can talk about this. People find that person someplace to live. The Hawkins can talk about it, and it's different people, different families, different, like, what? I don't even know you. I mean, I remember when Patrick rolled in. He didn't even know the cars. The car said, well, we got a bedroom. Move on in. Patrick said, I'll take the bedroom right next to your bedroom. How weird is that? (laughs) And you know what the car said? Okay. You know, I mean. Come on, man, what a beautiful story. I'm like, man, that happens all over the world. How can you say we don't care? They don't care. And I'm like, what are you talking about? People care all over the, all over the world. We are a family. We are a movement. Tell me who. <laughs> who? She wants names. Names. Can you believe that? She wanted names. Did I give her yours? Did I give her yours? Did I give her yours? Because if you can answer yes, we're still the temple. We're still the place where God's going to lead and work and move. God in his great mercy will always provide pools in case we ever fall short. But listen, people, don't be too impressed with the pool. If you don't deal with the self-focused nature of every American, there is always going to be problems with God's presence. Ananias did not lie to human beings. Oh, we got you. Take Kendall's phone. <laughs> okay, I got you. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go Go don't take my paper. Don't take my paper. <laughs> 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 just taking everything taking the ball go <laughs> oh bill thank you so much for that that uh very heart moving uh sermon um when, one of the things that stuck out to me was that we as a church are still god's dwelling place and how we act and how we uh show Jesus to others, that's what they, you know, that's what they see. They see, they see God in us and how we act. 
So let's, you know, let's make sure that we are acting the way Jesus did, making sure that we're, we're being God's church, as we, you know, no matter what we do. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Rosario, and this morning I'm going to lead our uh, thoughts into uh, communion this morning. So this year is a big year for me. From a, from a spiritual standpoint, this year I'll be, a, this October, I'll be a disciple for 25 years. And uh, that's, that's huge for me. I never thought, you know, when I became a disciple, I didn't think, you know, 25 years. It goes by just like that. But in that 25 years, I've learned a lot about my character. When I became a disciple, I was, I was a, a single. So I was in the singles ministry. So there's a lot that I learned about, um, about giving up my time, how to encourage. I also had to study the Bible with people. After, you know, the first week after I became a disciple, I was, you know, the guy, the, the guy that mentored me showed me how to study the Bible with people. And I was in a study right then and there. Yeah. 2003, I married the love of my life. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, being married, you learn how to give up your time, yeah. how to encourage, mm -hmm. and then also how to think of someone other than yourself, mm -hmm. to put the needs of someone else above your own. And then in 2004, I became a dad for the first time, and then again in 2010, I became a dad again. As a dad, you learn how to give your time. Yeah. <laughs> how to encourage, yeah. but then the big responsibility of teaching them about God and how to follow Jesus. You know, and throughout that, this whole time, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, it's, it's, I learned a lot about my character throughout those 25 years. And uh, probably... One of the, the biggest things that, that I learned and that I, I'm still, you know, I struggle with is fear of making mistakes. I hate that. I'm a perfectionist. My wife knows this. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. And uh, so it's, you know, fear of not being liked. Fear of not living up to expectations. You know, and then fear of people's like, reactions to what I do, what I say, how I say it. I worry a lot about what, how other people react. But my biggest fear is failing. I don't want to be known as a husband that failed or a father that failed or even a friend that failed. And so I, as I was thinking about this this week, as I was kind of putting this community message together, the one of the characters that I thought about most in the Bible was Peter. Okay. Peter's my hero. Yeah. Peter, you know, he, <laughs> you know, kind of his interactions with Jesus, he, you know, he just basically put his head forward and just moved. <laughs> that worrying about reacting, about what other people thought. But one of his biggest failures was denying Jesus three times yeah. before he went to the cross, before Jesus went to the cross. And after he knew that he betrayed him three times, denied him three times, he ran away and just wept bitterly. That's what the Bible says. How did he respond after that situation? Well, he went back to what he loved. Fishing. Okay. Went back to what he knew. I love to fish. I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do. But then after Jesus was resurrected, he went to Peter, and they reconciled. Pe uh, Jesus encouraged Peter, move forward. So how did Peter respond? Well, we, we read about in Acts chapter 2, he gave a sermon at Pentecost that resulted in 3,000 people becoming disciples. Huge impact, right? So you know what encourages me about Peter and just looking at his life is that he did not let his he did not let his failure of denying his friend 
to finance. You know, that encourages me because I, you know, um, because I can also not let my fear of mistakes or fear of consequences discourage me from pushing forward. How about you? How do you handle mistakes or failures? Are you the type of person that can, you know, okay, I made a mistake. I can move on. Let's go. If you're like that person, please come talk to me. (laughs) Or are you like me where you have a fear of failing, a fear of moving forward, or fear fear of making another mistake after that? You know what? We're all going to continue to make mistakes. Why? Because we are human. That's who we are. It's part of our life. But I want to encourage you with this, and this encourages me so much. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul says, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what's ahead, I press on the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then I love this quote it's from Martin Luther King Jr., The measure of a man's character is not determined by how he handles his wins, but how he handles his failures. Let that be said of us. That we handle our failures moving forward. Even though we get knocked down, we get right back up. Not let our fears and failures or our fear of failing keep us from moving forward. So as we take communion this morning, let's let's think about these things as we uh, and I will pray. Father, you're amazing. Thank you so much for allowing us this time together. Thank you so much for Peter and his example and just how he moved forward. And how you know he didn't let his failure of denying his 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 best friend to keep him from moving forward and having an impact on this world. We look in Acts and just so many different situations, just how he impacted people around him. And I pray that we as a church, that we never forget that you reside within us, that we are your uh, spokesperson, that we are an example to this world, that we can make mistakes, but that we repent that we can sin and that we repent, that we continue to move forward to the prize of one day being in heaven, that we can help each other along to do this, that we can encourage each other, that we can give of our time, and that we can love each other with all of our hearts. Thank you so much for this time this morning, Father. Love you. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you for everyone that made it out. Thank you for those that zoomed in. Thank you for those that watched on YouTube. Uh, this has been a great time of fellowship and worship, uh, but we're going to close out with a prayer. Uh, but I want to let those that are uh, on Zoom, uh, Kendall is going to break us out into breakout rooms. So you'll have an opportunity to get some fellowship in. Uh, so appreciate uh, all the effort that the uh, ushers have made. Uh, thank you for that. Um, those that are physically here, if you have a physical offering to give, just put it in the black box on the way out. Uh, and uh, someone not with apostles' feet will, uh, will go and get it uh, for the work of service for the fall. All right, well, let's uh, let's go to God in prayer, and then we will be uh, dismissed. Although, if you're in the building, uh, stay seated. We'll dismiss you in an orderly fashion. Amen? Uh, let's pray. God, we have been given much to think about today. And, uh, Father, it started even with that beautiful song that our sister Elizabeth wrote for such a time as this. God, it, uh, it, it really kind of began just even as the Spirit used uh, every part of this time from Manny's uh, offering to the, to the Great Communion uh, to the times of fellowship that we're about to, uh, about to have. Father, we praise you because you never give up on us. God, forgive us for the times when we overlook people. Forgive us for all the moments where needs have gone unmet. God, help us never to be spiteful for those that might turn to a pool or two. But God, also be with those that are still seeking but can't find it because every institution that's not filled with you is always seeking self first. Father, drive Satan far from our midst. God, help us to figure out new ways to be more cross-shaped like your son. God, give us insight and wisdom to know what to do with the things that we have heard today. But then, God, give us the courage to do it. God, help us to be people of action. Help us to be people of reflection. Help us to be people that are just simply the temple that bears your name. We pray all this because we have the hope that under his name, your son, Jesus, we can be exactly that for this, for this city. We love you and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed.